Um, morning, I'm thankful that every Sunday <clears throat> when Paul leads us and opens our time in prayer, Lord, you give him such wisdom to pray. Uh, at times this week, I've been at a loss as to how to pray for these parents whose children were killed, Lord, in this horrific school shooting in Texas, other than to ask that you would be merciful to them. And I, I do continue to ask that in the spirit of Psalm 123, Lord, that you would have mercy on these families and that you would redeem this situation. Lord, only you have the power to do these things. <clears throat> we are asking for God-sized miracles, but Christ himself remind us nothing is impossible for God. And so God, show your mercy in these circumstances so clearly that no one would miss, but that it is you who's operating there. Uh, one other prayer, Lord, we do pray for Alicia, who Willie said is suffering from a very serious, well, this ongoing um, serious case of vertigo. Father, we ask uh, that you would make her inner ear right, uh, that you would end this period of dizziness, uh, and that you would just give her orientation, Lord, uh, and cause her to be able to operate in life as she would like to be able to operate. Have mercy upon her and touch her. Lord, as Jim was praying a minute ago, I thought, goodness gracious in the world, there's the war in Ukraine, there's the shooting in Texas. As <clears throat> Paul was so good to pray, Lord, there all the shootings in our own city that we, we almost grow numb to it. But Lord, I pray that um, we would continue to pray. Uh, we're like Peter at the fo up foot of the mountain of transfiguration, uh, or rather in uh, John chapter six, when people were leaving and Jesus said, looked at Peter and said, will you leave now too? Mm -hmm. And Peter said, master, where will we go? You have the words of eternal life. Father, we have no one else to whom we can turn but to you. In situations like these, they are so big. But Lord, help us to turn to you in the small situations too. We thank you, Father. We praise you. We ask for your grace now on this teaching time as Paul has prayed for it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Um, just... One comment before we begin, today is the day that we honor our um, graduates, our high school graduates in the worship service. And I happen to know one of them fairly well. Uh, our own son. And uh, although, although he was going back and forth, when they printed the bulletin, they had him going to Wheaton College. He's actually going to go to the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and, uh, and study economics. And <clears throat> at this point, thinks that the Lord would uh, have him go to law school. We'll see. We'll see. And my notes are down here. I brought the wrong notes. <clears throat> but in the Lord's mercy, uh, Friday night was his graduation. And he won an award at the school that required that he give a speech. And I was the graduation speaker. <laughs> and so it's the first time I've ever gotten to speak with my son at the same time. Boy, what a, what a special, special time. The Lord was really merciful to us. Well, open your Bibles to 1 John. We're sort of coming toward the end of this study in 1 John 4. I need to talk with Mark and Paul about where you think the Lord has us headed next. But we'll, we'll be today in chapter 4, verses 13 to 21. So the last paragraph in chapter 4, and the context is pretty easy. Notice in uh, verse 12, the last verse of the previous paragraph, John has spoken again, no one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. So John picks up that abiding in God language and that's how he's going to open the next paragraph. Now, I don't know of a better way because what John does in this paragraph is 
he sort of weaves together in this tapestry, if you will, all the themes that he sounded throughout this letter. So if I were preaching a sermon from this paragraph, it'd be really hard to do. Um, but I don't know a better way than simply to walk through it together because each verse has an important message for us. And what you'll see is, again, he sounds the same themes he sounded throughout 1 John, but it occurred to me yesterday as well, it's not just that John refers back a lot to the gospel of John as well, but in particular, he refers back to John 13 through 16. Some of you know that John 13 through 16 is that talk, records that talk that Jesus gave to his disciples in the upper room as they were celebrating the Passover meal, the Seder together. Um, and John records much more of it than the, other, uh, than the other gospels do. And it struck me, it just as, as I was studying this yesterday again, it struck me how many times in this letter John refers back to that talk that Jesus gave the disciples. Apparently, that, and remember in the course of it, Jesus said the Holy Spirit will give you the ability to remember what I say. And it seems that John was really struck by that talk that Jesus gave them, that he remembered it in detail the rest of his life. And I thought, do the words of Jesus have that impact in my life too? I just wonder you know, if, because this, he may have written this 50 years, 55 years after he heard those words. And yet they were as fresh as the day that Jesus spoke them. And I thought, are Christ's words, which the whole Bible is Christ's word, are Christ's words, do they have that impact on me as well? Anyway, um, so let's begin in verse 13. We'll read the paragraph down to the end of the chapter, and then we'll simply walk through each verse. As I said, each verse, sometimes two verses together, have a message. This will sound familiar to you. I suspect a lot of this passage you know, you've quoted before, you've thought about before. So let's, uh, let's walk through it, and it will be God's blessing to us for today. Verse 13, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. May God add his blessing to our reading from his holy and inspired word. Let's go back to verse 13. John picks up the abiding language from verse 12. And of course, that abiding language comes from where? In the gospel of John. I'm the vine, you are the branches, abide in me, remain in me, and you will bear much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing, okay? So this whole idea of abiding, think of the vine and the branches, it's 
remaining steadfast, holding on to Jesus by the grace of God, receiving spiritual nutrition, if you will, from Christ through his word and the other means of grace that Jesus has given us to bear spiritual fruit, okay? By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us, okay? So this is the way John says, we know that we're abiding in Christ and Christ is abiding in us, that we're in spiritual union with the Lord Jesus Christ. How? Because he has given us of his spirit. So what John seems to be saying in this verse is the presence of the Holy Spirit in the life of the Christian. And remember, Paul says in Romans 8, verse 9, if you don't have the Holy Spirit living in you, you don't belong to Christ. If you are a Christian, the Holy Spirit has come to take residence up in your heart. That's what God promised in Ezekiel chapter 36. I will put my spirit in all of my people. Jesus said in John 14 to the disciples, the Holy Spirit has been with you, but the time is coming shortly when he will be in you. And I think Jesus's prepositions there are very important. So John says the evidence, one of the evidences that we truly abide in Christ and Christ in us, that we belong to Christ, that we are God's children, is the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, okay? So how aware are we of the presence of the Holy Spirit in us? The Holy Spirit being active in us. Do you sense, what are some of the things, we'll just quickly throw out this question. It's a good question. What are some of the ways that the Holy, the Bible says, the New Testament speaks of, all these works of the Holy Spirit. How do we know the Holy Spirit is at work in us? What would be the evidence that he's there and that he's at work? What does the Bible say, the New Testament say, the Holy Spirit does as he works in us? Marie? Yeah. First thing that you already mentioned is that he reminds us of God's word. And I can, I can remember some very specific times when in critical moments or in times when um, my faith has been challenged by a situation or a person that I could literally hear the Holy Spirit echoing God's word uh, instructing me. And I would be like, okay, and I go back to the scripture, the Bible, and I read, yeah. and it's exactly what I heard Good. say. Good. So Marie says one work, one way that the Holy Spirit works in us, he reminds us of the word of God, especially in particular circumstances. I think probably all of us have had that experience that in some circumstance of challenge, some truth from God's word will come to our minds. We know that's the Holy Spirit speaking that to us. Georgia? Um, one way that I believe and feel and know that the Holy Spirit is really in me when I belong <laughs> okay. Georgia says, one way I know the Holy Spirit's at work in me is when I can love somebody who sets himself up as my enemy. Mm -hmm. That's definitely true. Paul? It's transforming us in his image, so it's convicting us of sin uh, and giving us a desire for righteousness. Okay. okay. Excellent. He, Paul says he convicts us of sin. Jesus said he would do that in John 16. And not only that, he produces righteous. He gives us a desire for righteousness, okay, to overcome sin and to live in righteousness. Do you see that pattern in your life? As you see it, that's the Holy Spirit at work in you. He's producing spiritual fruit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, the fruit of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. He, um, he, he interprets God's word. This is great. First Corinthians 2, Paul says the Holy Spirit takes the things of God and explains them to us. 
And that's so wonderful. He, that, that when I come to read in my devotions, I, I try to, and, and most of the time I do pray, Holy Spirit, you gave this word in the first place. Peter says the prophets spoke as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So you gave us this word in the first place. Help me to understand. D don't just help me to understand it, but take something that I'm about to read and cause it to make a difference in my life today. Okay. Mm -hmm. you know, huh? There's an interesting thing. I can't remember where exactly, but where it talks in the context of persecution. Don't worry about what you're going to say. Matthew 10. Yeah, excellent. So Tom says, Matthew 10, Jesus promised when you're under persecution, don't worry about what you'll say. The Holy Spirit will give you the words to speak. And that's the testimony of hundreds of thousands of Christians throughout the ages. Jim? Uh, uh, he helps us pray. Uh, and when we don't know how to pray, he... Uh, I don't know how he, I don't know how he does it, but he works with our spirit to pray, you know, unto the, unto the God the Father. Yeah, he works, he, he intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words, Romans 8 says. Yeah, how exactly that works, I don't know, but have you ever groaned in prayer, <laughs> you know, and felt the Holy Spirit groaning through your groanings when you just don't know how to pray? Lord, I don't know how to pray in this. Sandy? Rosetta actually um, is in chat. Oh, Rosetta's in chat. Rosetta. He is a teacher. Can you bring that? Uh, he is a teacher. Excellent, Rosetta. Yeah, yeah he teaches us. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because that's it, but um, don't forget them. Because we all have no pain and we have to have a way. But I went into a situation where where I live at, that I was told because of my salvation, they were gonna move me out of this. Mm -hmm. They're gonna do me be part of them, or they're gonna make my life so miserable, I'm gonna move out. My reply was the person that brought me in this, I said, You brought me, so I'm gonna give it back to you. You go tell whoever said it that God put me here. The only way I'm going out because he got a better place for me to go. Uh, because uh, if they're not careful, they're going out to go me. So I went back and I started reading Romans 12, starting at verse 9. My mm -hmm. God told us about love, that love is genuine. Yeah. And I read it and I read it and I prayed and I meditated. And he said, we pay no one even for it, but give sight, give thought to do what is part in the sight of all. The apostles go and much depend on you. Be a peace with all. He said, we love never be in self, but leave it to the rest. Right. But if it be in Jesus' mind, I will repay, said the Lord. Mm hmm yeah, so Georgia is saying that the Holy Spirit gave her the grace in a particular situation not to retaliate, but exactly. to live the way that Romans 12 speaks about. So mm -hmm. if I not had the Holy Spirit, yeah. that couldn't have done that. Right, right. One more. Um, the seal of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit seals us in our salvation. Yeah, yeah. He seals us in our salvation. Somebody asked the other day, you know, how are you today? And I, I, it just occurred to me to say, well, I woke up and I'm still a Christian by the grace of God. <laughs> and he said, are you saying you can lose yourself? I'm not saying I'm going to wake up tomorrow. I'll still be a Christian tomorrow, but it'll still be the grace of God. And it's that sealing of the Holy Spirit. He keeps you. Now, consider in 1 John because, okay, Ron. Oh, yeah. Oh, I was just going to say what the Lord said about you. Yeah. Yeah. So again, the fruit of the spirit, especially peace in this particular wonderful guys, wonderful. So it's yeah, asked, are these do I see these works of the Holy Spirit? 
you know, in my life. And in first John, John is really more clear than any place else in the new Testament that not only are you and I as Christians in spiritual union with God, the Holy spirit, but also with God, the father, we abide in the father, the father abides in us. We abide in the son, the son abides in us. I mean, think about it. We are in spiritual union with the triune God. One God eternally subsisting in three persons, God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy spirit. So God dwells in us in all of his fullness. Uh, and he has mighty works that he wants to do in and through us. Okay, so that's verse 13. One of the ways we know we abide in God, and God abides in us, that we truly are God's children, is the Holy Spirit. Do we see the evidence of the Holy Spirit doing in our lives what the New Testament says the Holy Spirit does? And in addition to everything else, we've mentioned before Romans 8, 16, the Holy Spirit testifies to our human spirits that we are the children of God. He confirms that in us. Now look back at verse 324. John says the same thing a lot. Do you, um, do you need someone to say to you the same thing more than once sometimes? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay. So John's really, he's really good at saying the same thing slightly differently about six different times. So look at chapter three, verse 24. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in him and he in them. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. Same idea as verse 13. Peter says, I stir you up by way of reminder. Remember that language? Second Peter one. Okay, so John is stirring us up by way of reminder. So verse 14, what does the Holy Spirit do? And I'll, I'll show you this connection in just a minute. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Okay, so one of the works of the Holy Spirit in us is to testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. So we, do we see the Holy Spirit doing that work in us, causing us to testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world? Now, why do I say the Holy Spirit? John doesn't explicitly say in verse 14, the Spirit does that. I think the connection with verse 13 is clear enough. But listen to John 15, 26 to 27, where Jesus makes the same point. Again, John is remembering things that Jesus told him. Jesus had an unbelievable impact on the life of John. But when the helper comes, this is John 15, 26 to 27, when the helper, the Holy Spirit comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. So the Holy Spirit first bore witness to your soul that Christ is the Savior. And then the Holy Spirit bears witness through you and through me that Christ is the Savior. So get the order. First, the Holy Spirit bears witness to my soul that Jesus is the Savior. And then once the Holy Spirit has given me the new spiritual birth, he bears witness through me that Jesus is the Savior. So let's look at this language again. Verse 14, we've seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Does anybody know that language, that title for Jesus, that specific title, the Savior of the world, in that specific language, the Savior of the world, appears one other place in the New Testament. I wouldn't have been able to guess it, but I've looked it up. <laughs> anybody know where it is? Yes, John. Yeah, the Gospel of John. Good guess, Paul Amos. John chapter 4, and it appears on the lips of the Samaritans. 
Remember, after talking with the Samaritan woman at the well, Jesus stays in the Samaritan village for two days. And a lot of the Samaritans believe on him. And at the end of it, they confess, we believe him to be the savior of the world. So given that context, what does it mean to confess that Jesus is the savior of the world? It means Jesus doesn't just save Jews, Jesus saves Samaritans. And Jesus saves Peruvians. And Jesus saves Russians. And Jesus saves Romanians. <laughs> Jesus saves, if, if you're going to be saved, whatever you are, whatever your ethnicity, whatever people group you belong to, if you are going to be saved, who's going to save you? Jesus. Jesus. He is the only Savior. There is no salvation apart from him. And John says, the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to testify that he is the Savior of the world. There is no other Savior apart from Jesus Christ. God has never set anybody else forth other than the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no salvation apart. The, the apostles declared it. Acts 4, verse 12. There is no other name under heaven by which men may be saved other than the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Or think back to John 14, that same passage, right? I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Right? So, but the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to confess that. Verse 15, as uh, John is talking about confession. So confession is speaking with the mouth, right? Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So now let's stop a second because John in this letter has been very concerned to set out the characteristics of a person who truly is a Christian, okay? If this characteristic and this characteristic and this characteristic and this characteristic are true of you, then by all appearances, you are genuinely a believer, okay? But take it also, if you're genuinely a believer, then these characteristics should be evident in your life. So yesterday I went and just walked back through the letter of 1 John and I collected these. So if you've got a handout, it's on page two. And, and the reason remember is that these churches to which John is writing had this group that went out from them under the influence of false teachers. And John has written, they went out from us because they were not of us. So John is very concerned that these readers would be able to identify the real thing from the false thing, okay? The real Christian from the false. So these are the characteristics. The true believer walks in the light, chapter one, verse seven. The true believer keeps God's commandments. And of course, a lot of these are just saying the same thing in a different way. Chapter two, verse three, chapter three, verse 24. Three, the true believer walks in the way that Jesus walked, chapter two, verse six. Four, the true believer <clears throat> loves his or her brothers and sisters in Christ. This is the point that John emphasizes the most. Chapter two, verse 10, chapter three, verse 19, chapter four, verse seven, chapter four, verse 16. Five, the true believer confesses that Jesus is the Christ. That is the Messiah, the Savior King, chapter 2, verses 23 through 24. Now, I'm going to ask you when I finish the list, what do you notice about this list? Just in a big picture sense, what do you notice about the list? Number six, the true believer lives a life characterized by righteousness rather than ongoing sin, chapter 3, verses 6 through 8. Number seven, 
The true believer has the spirit of God abiding in him or her. Chapter 3, verse 24, and we just saw it. Chapter 4, verse 13. And 8, the true believer confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh. Chapter 4, verses 2 through 3. So now there's a ninth characteristic, okay? Um, and that is that we confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, what do you notice about that list in the big picture sense? Not the details, but the big picture sense. As you go down it, what do you notice about it? True believer uh, becomes more like Jesus. Okay, that's, that's important. A true believer becomes true. more like Jesus. Walks in the way that Jesus walked. Absolutely. Linda? So your life is a reflection of your beliefs. Not just that they're internalized or your thoughts, but that they're outward. In your, in your daily life. Okay, excellent, guys. Really good. So notice that there is, uh, among the characters, there's belief. Okay, there's what I believe that I confess with my mouth. Notice how often John says that. There's something I believe, and I confess that with my mouth, but it's also a lot about how you live. But notice it's not one or the other, right? It's a both and, and I'm going to suggest that, as Linda did, the way that you live actually rises. What do you believe? What do you believe about God? The way that you live is going to be determined by what you believe about God, who you believe God to be, what you believe Him to be like. That's your good. Now, if you believe, if you really believe that God is sovereign over all creation. If you believe that Ephesians 1.11 is true, that God works all things according to the counsel of his will. If you believe that Psalm 115 verse three is true, our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. If you believe that God really is in charge of the universe and that a sparrow cannot fall to the ground apart from the permission of God, and that a black hole cannot exist apart from the permission, the sovereign permission of God, then you will live a certain way. That will affect the way you live. So notice that the list, it's belief that we confess. Okay, one of the sweetest moments in this church, every month, right before the Lord's Supper, when we confess the faith, from the Apostles' Creed. We are standing and we are saying, albeit in English, the same words that believers have said for 1850 years. Believers have confessed those words that we confess. Okay? Now, if we believe what we confess to be true, it has, John is saying, it, it, it means you'll live a certain way. If Christ is the only Savior, if Christ is Lord, you will live a certain way. You will live the way that Christ lived. Sandy? So all these are action items that we have to actually do. Mm -hmm. But we don't do it on our own strength. It really is the Holy Spirit's power within us that causes us to understand the Word of God so that then we can do those actions. Sandy, yes, yes. Thank you so much. It is only by the grace of God. It is only by the grace of God that they are action items, but I don't do it in my in my own strength. I have to have the grace of God. It has to be the Holy Spirit doing this in my life. And the more we understand the Word of God, the more we understand our desires become different. Because when you understand how much you're loved by God, it's easy. Well, to look, yeah, yeah. Look what John says about you know, understanding how much you're loved by God and the verses that follow. Yeah. To, uh, so, um, you know, in the, in the graduation speech, there's a moment um, that I talked about this. I encouraged them, you know, stay in the scriptures, stay in the scripture. So important. There is a moment in the coronation service for a new monarch of the United Kingdom, a new king or new queen. Now we haven't had one since 1953. Uh, and Lord willing, it'll be a while before we have a new king or queen. <laughs> I happen to like this one. But uh, in any event, 
there's a moment when the moderator of the Church of Scotland, okay, that's the head of the Church of Scotland, presents the new king or queen of Bible and says these words, and I quote, this is the most valuable treasure this world affords. This is the most valuable treasure this world affords. And yet those countries don't follow it anymore. <laughs> Uh, even, even dear Scotland does it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's go back to the text. Cause I, I want to get to the really familiar part. Okay. Um, so if we confess Jesus, these characteristics of the true believer, they're both belief and actions, belief and actions, those work together. So we have come, I'm in verse 16. So we've come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. Same thing as verse eight. We talked about it last week. And whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. Okay, I'm only gonna stop to make this point. So we have come to know, okay, through our confession of Christ, we have come to know and believe the love that God has for us because we've seen that love and God sending his son to die for our sins. John 3.16 is in the background here. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him might not perish, but have everlasting life. I'll just say this really quickly. Uh, we've come to know and to believe the love that God has for us, okay? Now, I believe with a lot of the New Testament commentators, that phrase, the love that God has for us, that phrase doesn't just mean, I know God loves me, but it's also true, John 17, 26, that God has taken his love that he experiences within himself, and he's actually planted it in my heart. Now, that's a transformative thought. The love that God has experienced within himself among the three persons of the one God forever, God has taken that love and put it in my heart. So it's not just that I experience the love of God for me, though that is exceedingly wonderful, and John is about to tell us just how wonderful, it's not, that's not the only truth, but God has actually put his own love. His capacity to love lives within me, which is why Georgia could love people who didn't love her. Okay. Now, we've got to move on. Okay. Verse 17, by this is love perfected within us, with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment because as he is, so also we're in the world. We're in the world now and we're waiting the day of final judgment. But then verse 18 goes with it. This is the famous verse. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Okay, so we know the love that God has for us. We've seen it in the sending of his son to die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. So what does our knowledge of God's love for us do? It drives fear out of our lives. What kind of fear does it drive out of our lives? Yeah, Marie? The fear of judgment. Okay. Here specifically, it's the fear of final judgment. I don't have to fear that when I stand in final judgment, God will condemn me because I've known the love of God in Jesus Christ, the redeeming love of God in Jesus Christ. And having known that, I do not fear standing before God in final judgment. I mean, that's really clear. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear for fear has to do with punishment and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Now, again, it's not that God does not discipline us in this world for our sins, Hebrews 12. Clearly he does. But that 
it, we're expressively expressly told in Hebrews so, is by God's love. So think of the most loving father you could think of who never punished his children in some sort of judicial sense. He would discipline them for their good. Okay. Um, I shouldn't say that because there is a sense in which judicial punishment by a parent is a right thing to do. Okay, so I wanna, wanna retract that last sentence, okay, and bring it back. But the prevailing idea in a parent's heart is I want you to learn from this. I want you to share the character of God. And when God disciplines us, we're told in Hebrews 12, he wants us to share in his character. So, okay, this is the, the, the last point we're going to make. This is important. And we all know this verse, right? Perfect love casts out fear, right? Everybody's familiar with that idea. Okay, perfect love casts out. Marie's right. In the context, in the context, perfect love casts out fear of judgment. But... I've heard Christians apply it far beyond the final judgment. Right? That perfect love should cast out all kinds of fear or all fear in my life. Is that an appropriate application of 1 John 4? No. no. Fear of God is the way to reduce it. Okay, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, but what's the fear of God? Okay. I, the, I, Isaiah 11, 3 says of the Messiah, his delight will be in the fear of the Lord. Hmm. Hmm. Study of the fear of the Lord is really interesting in the Bible. It sounds, huh? What does that mean? The fear of the Lord, you want my definition? Okay, this is, uh, this is, all right. This years of thinking about this, um, not that it's a perfect effort, worshipful obedience. The fear of the Lord is worshipful obedience. If we understand in the word worshipful, a sense of God's holiness and God's beauty. Now I could explain that for the next half hour. Okay, fear of the Lord, worshipful obedience. So in the phrase, the other phrase that we quoted, are you saying that that worshipful obedience is a delightful thing? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And, or maybe put it this way, Linda, and then I'll, I'll get to Jim in just a second here because he wants to say something. So, perfect love casts out all fear. I'm going to say that that actually does apply to all kinds of fear. Think about it this way. Let's suppose that God is calling me to take a stand at work of some kind, okay? And by taking a stand at work, there's a possibility either I could suffer persecution, people would make life miserable for me at work, or I could even lose my job. And I'm fearful, okay? Or God is calling me to confront a Christian who's a good friend of mine, about sin in that person's life. And I know that if I do it, I'm afraid I could lose that friendship because of the way this person is. Um, if I'm convinced of the love of God for me, part of being convinced, so this is, this is my argument, okay? part of being convinced of God's love for me is being convinced that that love will mo move him to work all things together for my good, okay? just as the Bible says. So are you saying in approaching situations like that where, are you saying you have no fear when you approach the situation because you overcome it? Yeah, your I'm saying, that, yeah, yeah, I'm saying we have no fear in the sense that we, um, we worry about the circumstances. Okay? I'm saying, the, the love of God, the conviction I have that God loves me, that's born that, you know, how do I have that conviction? I've seen God send his only son to die on the cross 
to pay the penalty for my sins. I have seen, I've known the love of God for me. It's sort of like the logic, Linda, of Romans 8, 32. If God didn't spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also together with him graciously give us all things? So if I'm in this situation where God is challenging me to do something hard and I'm fearful of the consequences, right? The, my conviction, okay, God loves me and God loving me means he didn't spare Jesus for me. If he didn't spare Jesus, he's going to give me everything else I need and he's going to work these circumstances for my good. I don't have to be afraid in these circumstances. I need to obey God. Can you still know those things and still be afraid? I think as a practical matter, we might be. But I think that John really wants us to come to the point where perfect love, the knowledge that God loves me, causes me to be so secure in his will for my life that, I, that, that I'm not afraid. See, I really think Jim gets to go first. No, that He's been, you. huh? All I want to say is that thank you. I need you there. <laughs> <laughs> if it, you, you sift it. Let the Lord sift it, okay? And You know, I, I heard somebody say that uh, the fear of the Lord is, uh, no, that's, this is their way of thinking of it, is to, is to have a fear uh, of sinning against the Lord. Mm -hmm. you know, that's, uh, and I don't know whether that captures the whole thing. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how you can capture because the, there's an English writer named Michael Reeves who uh, published a book last year on the fear of the Lord. And it's just, it's just excellent. I mean, it's, it, and he really, and he never, uh, you know, because I looked through the book, the first thing I did, okay, where does he define the fear of the Lord? He never does. He just lets the Bible speak, okay? So he deals with all these passages. And by the end of it, the fear of the Lord is not what you thought it was. It was really not. And he just takes Bible. It's just Bible. That's all he does, especially the, the Old Testament, obviously. Mm -hmm. Marie? Yeah, I, was, um, I was meditating recently on a couple of the other books of the Old Testament prophets. And thinking about uh, the fear of the Lord, the fear of um, is is really like a, a deep, deep reverence for his for his holiness and his uh, righteousness because um, everything God declares of Himself, everything He does, He does in righteousness uh, and justice and. Um, it's hard, I think it's hard for us as humans to really fully understand that, but um, I was talking with the gentleman yesterday at the bus stop, and he was saying, well, if God is so powerful, why does he allow all of these things to happen? And I said, God is all powerful, he's sovereign over us, and in his sovereignty, he created us in his image, and his likeness, I said, and he's given us his instructions. And we have a responsibility to follow and obey him. And when we don't, there are many things that are happening, happening in this world. And uh, God is ultimately going to judge all of these things. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he came back and he said, well, you know, I don't know if you really still answered my question. And I said, well, think of it like this. I said, technically, even though we think of each other as good, this one's good and this one's not good. But God's word says no one is good except for God. Right. So technically, we're all really evil in one degree or another. And I said, so if God was to deal with our sin right now, he would destroy all yeah. of us. I said, yeah. but he is patient toward us, not willing that he should carry right. the all to come to repentance. So I think it kind of helps him, but I'm still praying for him. I asked him his name. Yeah. I remember the prayer good. Him that was Hardly open to really yeah. understand. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good, Marie. Linda, maybe think, because <clears throat> um, it, it, it caused me to come back to something we said earlier. Remember when we were looking at all those characteristics 
of a true Christian from first John, we said, if there's belief and there's action, okay, the fear of the Lord is, involves both of those. It involves beliefs about God, an attitude toward God, beginning with he's a holy God. So. Fear in the spiritual sense of the Lord more like an awe. I think it is. I feel you know, fear in the way we think of yeah. the world is yeah. not, not the same. Luther actually said something that was helpful to me, Linda. Luther, when he talked about the fear of the Lord, he said, maybe there are two kinds of fear in the world. He said, there's servile fear, S-E-R-V-I-L-E. -E. He said, servile fear is the fear a servant has of a cruel master who beats him. Okay, that's, that's not the fear of the Lord. There is also what Luther called a filial, a uh, childlike fear. Okay, and he said filial fear is the respect, the awe, the love, the obedient heart that a child has toward a father or a mother that that child is convinced loves me. Okay, and will discipline me for my good. So Luther said he thought the fear of the Lord in the Bible is more that filial fear rather than that servile. It's not that servile fear, at least for believers. Okay, now for unbelievers, the fear of the Lord is a different thing. The fear of the Lord is the fear of the Lord. <laughs> yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it, it gets back to what you were saying earlier. If, uh, if we believe God, that means we have to believe every word that He's spoken to us, every word that He said in His Bible, we believe that, and then we walk worthy of the gospel. Yeah. And yeah. So that fear that you're asking about, I think, covers all of fear because we go back to the number one, thirty one. Whoever listens to me will really be true and be free from the fear of danger. And you can the there and add whatever you want. Yeah, yeah. And just, you know, to, <clears throat> to sort of close it out with a little bit of a personal illustration, I am an ordained Southern Baptist pastor. And last Sunday, a report was issued about <clears throat> sexual abuse within our denomination over the last 25 years. And it was devastating because there were people. <laughs> All right, <laughs> that's the that's the sign. But there were people in leadership in our denomination who said all the right things, you know, and preached powerfully. I mean, I heard them preach, and yet we're living over here in a completely different way. And so, you know. That confession it needs to be true, you know. And somebody wrote, you know, we've been moralistic rather than moral. Okay, so it's a both. I mean, it's it's belief, but that belief has to translate into the way you live. Okay, so let's let's yeah. I just have an example of an earthly example. So I was raised by a very loving father, but he disciplines. And I remember that if he was looking at me a certain way, I knew I better not do that. But it wasn't fear like he was going to spank me. It was just a respect. Yeah. I wanted to do what he wanted me to do. Yeah. I think All that's the... Do, we called it the look. He'd give us the, the look. look. We knew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sandy. Oh, Rosetta. Oh, the fear of the Lord means you are now teachable with true knowledge, which is, thank you, Rosetta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's certainly a big part of it. Just before you pray, can you remind everybody if there's a prayer meeting in this room at 1 o'clock? Prayer, prayer meeting in this room for the city. Yeah, pray for the city. Goodness gracious. We're just catching up with you for the fear of the Lord. If you see uh, Psalm 51, it's so, so David's heart to the Lord. But God, do not take the spirit from you. It's yeah. The yeah. 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 It's, it's, Psalm 51 is a great expression of the fear of the Lord of somebody who sinned terribly and just, yeah. Oh, that's, oh, thank you. Thank you, Chandler. That's great. All right. We better pray. They want us to leave. <laughs>
Heavenly Father, thank you for um, stirring in our hearts this morning. And I suspect that you know, John has a thousand different thoughts in this passage. So it may be that everybody, Lord, by the work of your Holy Spirit in us, everybody may take a different thought away. Whatever it is, God, this is your word. You want your word to have its way in each of our hearts. And so grant that whatever you're speaking through this word in 1 John 4 today, in each of our lives, we would receive it, God. The Holy Spirit in us would cause it to cause us to receive it as true, to believe it, and then to act on it in our lives in tangible ways this week. We commit the coming service of worship to you. We pray for Pastor Philip that you would grant him your word, Lord, today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Amen. Thank you.